Hi, I'm Randy Cantrell. Welcome to the Year of the Peer podcast with Leo Batari. This podcast is based on a simple truth. Who you surround yourself with matters. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari will interview thought leaders from all walks of life who will share how they leverage peer advantage and show you how engaging your peers more purposefully can hold the key to greater success in business and in life. Today's guest is Tim Sanders, former Yahoo Chief Solutions Officer. Tim Sanders has consulted with industry leaders, governments, and trade associations on sales processes, new media, leadership development, and talent management. He's one of the top rated speakers on the lecture circuit and a widely quoted best selling business author. Tim has been featured in Fast Company, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and ABC News. His philosophy on business life is simple share your knowledge, network, and compassion to multiply the value of everyone you interact with. We welcome Tim to the show. Tim Sanders, you're there somewhere. Welcome to the show. Hey, hey. To be, glad, glad to be with you, Leo. Glad to be with you, buddy. <laughs> well, great to have you here. I have to tell you that, um, you know, it's been really excited. I remember when your work first came out back in 2002 with Love is the Killer app. And, um, you know, it made me kind of get reacquainted with it now, because as you know, our podcast, The Year of the Peer, is really dedicated to this idea that who you surround yourself with really matters, and it matters a lot. How we treat each other matters a lot. And, you know, in a world kind of as, you know, we kind of shared some thoughts on this uh, by email, where, you know, trust in our institutions is low, we have to depend on one another. And when we have this right. fast changing world, we, it's essential that we're able to collaborate and do so really, really well. So I'd love to get started, first of all, with maybe you can give a little background. Of course, you, you'll be well known among our audience, but at the same time, it would be great for you to talk a little bit about your background. And then let's get into some of the content of Love is the Killer app. And then I want to also talk about how that translates into the role that you had, of course, as Chief Solutions Officer at Yahoo. So... Sure, absolutely. Okay, so I'm a guy from a farming community in eastern New Mexico, right on the border of West Texas. I was raised by my grandmother. I took all of my childhood experiences and kind of poured them into a game-changing opportunity in the mid-1990s when I had a chance to go to work for Mark Cuban at Broadcast.com. And at the time, the company was called AudioNet. Later, they changed the name of the company. But Cuban um, was an amazing influence, not just on me, but everybody that worked with him at the time. He believed that the secret to success is to make love, not war. Find out what the customer wants and give it to them without any objection. He believed that the future was in books. And he got me on a tear, Leo, where I became a voracious reader and a dedicated student of the game because he believed that in times of great change, we could add a lot of value to our colleagues and customers by having something valuable to share, especially insights, complex solutions to complex problems. So during that time with Cuban, I really began to try out this, this new theory I had. And the theory I had was really something that I'd been raised by, by people like a Zig Ziglar or even a Norman Vincent Peale or even Napoleon Hill to go old school. And the idea was that if you promote other people's success and all you expect from them is for them to seize the opportunity and pay it forward, you will build an outstanding brand. You'll put yourself around the right kind of people. And when you achieve your own success, which you will, you'll look back on it later in your career, as I'm doing now, and you'll enjoy the whole thing a second time. You know, it's great to hear. And it's become such a common denominator, quite frankly, among the very successful guests that we've had on the program prior. And it makes sense, right? It's among the reasons they're successful is because they have been very, I think, very generous with others and very supportive in others. And they know that if they believe in other people, um, you know, how important that really is. But you use this mm -hmm. word love, which often mm. is certainly not uh, as, as common uh, part of the business lexicon as it, as it probably should be. Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess what would be fun would be to explain the difference between, I think most of us may know what a mad dog is, but we're not really sure what a love cat is and, and what that's like. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. And, Cause it was a, such a great way that you opened the book by sharing that comparison. Well, 
I wanted to become a successful person. I knew I had to become a specific type of business person to become successful. There was an old song in the 80s by The Cure called Love Cats. I loved the line, we move like cagey tigers. No two can get closer than this. And within that described a business person at the time that I admired, who was highly successful because of his generosity, but he was not a person to be taken lightly. I'm referring Leo to Herb Kelleher, founder wow. of Southwest Airlines. Um, someone had referred to him as a tough old love cat, and that's where everything clicked. And here's the idea. Um, nice, smart people succeed. Do not forget the second word, smart. Herb Kelleher succeeded because not just he was generous, but because he understood that love requires technique, especially at work. And what I mean by this is that in the professional sense, Leo, what I, when you love somebody, what it means is that you will share your intangibles with them, your knowledge and your network and your compassion to promote their success. You have an emotional feeling about them. It's called caring. And you're, you want to share something with them. You want them to avoid the unnecessary suffering in their business lives. And, and that's what I see people like Herb and a lot of other people I've met over the last 20 years doing. But it is an issue of how do you improve your giving technique to pick the right heroes, help them in a way that they act on, mentor them to pay it forward, and then manage your ego when the occasional person doesn't say thank you, doesn't give you gratitude, doesn't give you anything in return, which I don't expect, or in some cases takes your advice, runs with it, and later competes with you. That's a real technique challenge for someone over the course of their career to deal with what I call ego economics. You know, it's great that you brought up Southwest too, because let's face it, love and the heart and all of that remain a centerpiece uh, of the Southwest culture. Yep. And it is. what, what yep. was also interesting, I think, was that Herb also understood about what it took to make something happen as opposed to just focus on the result. If you want to deliver mm -hmm. shareholder value, if you want happy customers, he knew that it was treating your people. It was your people, your right. employees who made that possible. And, and I think this idea you know, what you shared too about with Mark Cuban. I mean, there's, a, there's this idea of do for the customer what you need to do, you know, for that customer to make them happy. And employees were empowered to make decisions. Uh, and they do That's right. things. And there are great stories that you hear about today. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, Cuban empowered us to tear up an invoice and eat it if, if the client didn't feel like they were successful. He had something called the two minute rule. I love this one. So basically, um, if someone sent you an email like your customer and they said, hey, Tim, that really didn't meet our expectations. I'm a little disappointed with this. You had two minutes to call them live, be accountable in the moment and make plans to fix it. He hated the idea that someone sends you an email and you socialize it and you get safe and you rehearse it and then a day later you write this perfect email and reply. He's like, no, you pick up the phone. That's something no one else is going to do in our space. And I got to tell you, it worked. I'd have people that maybe email me because there was some technical glitch or something that because it was video, right? So it's kind of tricky. It's not like it is here today. Um, and they'd email me and say, Tim, I'm not that happy. And boom, I'd call him in 10 seconds she would be almost apologetic that she sent the email in the first place. She'd say, I was just thinking about you because they really responded to that in the moment accountability where I come and I'd say, all right, what can we do? Should we do another broadcast and get it right? Do you want me to kill part of the invoice? Is there something that I can do to avoid this in the future? And to empower your employees to do the right thing in the right moment, that's really about creating a culture, right? So Cuban created a culture of customer focus, like manic customer focus, and he considered our greatest innovation challenges was to be profitable despite our laser focus on customer service, okay? So that was the culture. Southwest Airlines, on the other hand, had a culture of love, and they chose the word love because they knew that word was divisive, especially in their war with Braniff. If they just mm -hmm. said, we care about you, that's a really safe way to approach it. NLP says love is coded into our, our psyche as something significant, something vulnerable. Do you know that Southwest Airlines stock ticker is LUV? Yeah. Their first big ad campaign was somebody up there loves you. So culture is a conversation. 
led by leaders about what we value and what succeeds at this company. And at Southwest Airlines, loving each other and being kind hearted with the customers, the flyers, that's the culture they hire and develop and onboard and reward and succeed by. And that's why I think they're such an amazing case study in getting it right. You know, I think they are. But one of the things that I loved about your book is, you know, you do such a nice job early on of explaining what is going on and actually illustrating what love is about in, in the workplace. And, and at the same time, what I really enjoyed was you gave people a framework for how to execute it themselves, right? Talking right. about technique, how, right? Technique. And exactly. And, and compassion. So those three uh, legs of the stool, if you will. If you could talk a little bit about those for our audience, I think that would be really helpful in terms of helping them feel like how can they bring love into yep. their own workplace and into their own relationships. So what this is, Leo, is it's a combination of lifestyle design and relationship style, if you will. So it's really those two things. That's about what I figured out and begin to put together as the system. So knowledge sharing is the foundation of a powerful relationship at work, especially during times of uncertainty, especially during times of change. And dude, we live in the times of most change ever. I'm 55 years old, ain't seen nothing like it. And I've been through the quality revolution. I've been through the birth of dot com. So when times are weird, information from a friend is gold, okay? But knowledge sharing isn't just about me showing up and telling you what I know, it's about me aggregating knowledge and insights so I have something unique to share with you. So the first thing I had to do was to develop my system for studying as an adult, not as a college student. And what I focused on, Leo, was reading books. I told you Mark influenced me. Well, he was a really avid book reader. I mean, while he would read the Wall Street Journal or the occasional Fast Company, he probably spent 80% of his study time reading books. And I learned from him that in a book, you get a long form argument. You get the entire um, idea construct. You get the case studies. You get the statistics. You get the takeaways. You get the prescriptions. And if you read it like a student marking it up, I have a system I talk about, Cliff and Tag. If you mark a book up, and you make notes in the back that are relevant to current projects, are good for current customers, you can go back and reread it in 10 minutes for the high points and grasp that whole thing all over again. And the reason it's so important to read books, I recommend you read a book cover to cover every month, every month, is because it changes the way you think. It makes your brain ask why more than once hopefully five times to really believe and understand an argument. But more importantly, when you're out in the field sharing an idea with a customer or with a colleague that works for you, you're not going to be skin deep like everybody else reading some blog post or USA Yesterday, right? Um, you're going to have depth when you talk to people. You'll be able to transfer an idea. And here's the cool thing I learned early in this, this process. If you read a book on behalf of a customer based on his or her problems, whatever's going on in their industry that they're trying to figure out. And then you give that book to them as a gift along with your cliff notes and make that a substitute for your next PowerPoint presentation. They will love you back. And I'll tell you something else. You will never get dumber in the act of prescriptive reading outside your swim lane. So I started to do that in the early 2000s. Like one out of three books I read was for somebody else's benefit. Today, it's like a 50-50 mix. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of knowledge sharing. Here's the last thing I'll say about sharing knowledge. We should always be mentoring people. It's one thing for me to give you a couple of tips, like, hey, this is the kind of webcam I use or whatever. That's a tip, that's a technique. While that's valuable and brings you know, return on attention to a conversation. Mentorship is a commitment. You know, mentorship is me, the humble teacher, recognizing you as the hero on a journey, going somewhere a little too fast. You need a teacher to give you a gift for the next stage of your journey. That's love. That's caring about a person. But I'll tell you something else. Mentorship is about caring about the ecosystem you live in, right? You mentor the heroes so they don't crash and burn because we need more heroes in the world we live in. So the idea here is look for people that demonstrate heroic qualities. They've got courage. They've got a set of values that resonate with you. They have ambition. They got pluck, but you look for that little gap in their insight arsenal that you think you can help, and that's who you mentor to. And don't get stuck in the Star Wars karate kid wise old man you know, way of thinking about it. It's not about you at the end of your career taking some 20-something under your wing. That's not mentorship. Mentorship is helping anyone 
In fact, if you go back to Greek mythology, because I'm kind of wonky about this, mentorship's roots in Greek mythology started with lesser gods and humans giving advice to the gods like Hercules. Many of them were punished for having the audacity. That's why when you look at the word menos, which is what mentor comes from, um, yes, it initially means mental, but some definitions also suggest it means the courage to teach. So everywhere you go, look for the hero. Don't worry about his rank versus your title. Mentor people, and you'll generate incredible relationships. By the way, you just may learn something. Well, you know, this whole notion of knowledge sharing and our peers, I think, is extremely powerful. Let's face it, if you and I and our producer Randy and we got a few other people and we all read the same book and mm -hmm. we got together for a couple of hours, after that two-hour time period, we would understand that content so much better yeah. from having shared with one another. It not only embeds the learning, but I think the other thing it helps us do is it can give us the courage to act. You know, when we read something in a book, we might not want to implement it in our company right. tomorrow. We may not have that you know, belief that we can or, or should do that. And yet, I think oftentimes when we can learn together, it can be extremely powerful. Absolutely. You know, um, we used to always joke and call it the new, new thing. You know, Michael Lewis wrote a book about this. So sometimes you'll read a book and it's just a little bit ahead of the curve and you kind of know it. Like, like I could you know, go on and on now about, say, artificial intelligence, and it could change anything. So, like, like if you were in healthcare, I'd tell you, wow, you know, artificial intelligence is going to get rid of everything but the nurses, and you'd be like, oh, what? And it's a little <laughs> bit ahead of the game, but if I laid out for you about an AI and machine learning is going to reduce malpractice, especially in surgery and actual treatment, blah, 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 I'm not quite ready to commit to that yet, saying I'm going to go into that business with you and I'm going to try to take you down that road. But as I talk to you and you give me real world feedback, you say, okay, Tim, here's, here's a couple of the things it can't do yet. Here's a couple of challenges that lay in front of that solution. And I hear you, but as we talk it through and maybe I go read something else to complement that, we're having a very rich, if not a very deep conversation about something. And through this feedback combined with what I've learned, I will generate the confidence to act once I see acting is time, right? And, you know, you're not going to get that kind of actionable knowledge just talking to people when you need to read. But you're also not going to get that actionable knowledge just reading. You need to share. In Love is the Killer app, I say, you know, having knowledge and having awareness of insights is important, but it only becomes real when you share it with someone else. Because life is about these collaborative conversations where we play yes and with each other. So knowledge sharing, even though I think about it as like bringing a gift to every conversation, it's really the ultimate way to collaborate, to find the courage to seize our future. So I think you're spot on with that observation. Well, and also, you know, in addition to knowledge sharing, what I love is that you, uh, you know, have your own way to explain this notion of networking and compassion. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to share that with us as well. So think about it this way. You have three intangibles as a person that you can share. And if you have good technique and you do it smart, they actually grow as you give them away, okay? That's different than money or resources that are tangible. They, they don't grow as you give them away, right? So that's why I really isolated knowledge and your network of relationships and your human compassion as the easiest ones to share that make the biggest impact. So here's the idea. Knowledge is the foundation of the relationship. This is where you generate trust on the other side. This is where you generate that collaborative interdependence on the other side. So now you can take it pardon the pun, to second base. Because your network is your net worth. It's the greatest asset you have, okay? And you want to be very careful about who you share that with. In the book, I talk about the idea that the difference between just sharing knowledge, which I would do with anyone, and sharing my network where I need to be selective, the difference is like ham and eggs. The chicken is involved, <laughs> but the pig is fully committed. So networking is something you do once you've developed that kind of trust. And the difference in my mind between being a networker and a super connector is that the networker sees meeting people as a shortcut to success or a stepping stone to success. So let's just say the networker is a prospect in sheets clothing. They really are. They're a prospector. They're actually out looking for opportunities, showing interest, 
because that's how you generate a conversation. But ultimately, they go to networking events to meet new people, to generate new opportunities, right? That's a networker. And that's why so many people aren't into networking events. Like, like the love cats of the world always kind of find that like, Ugh, I hate going to these networking things and pushing myself on people and handing out business cards and selling and selling. Super connector is a different person. When you share your network of relationships, you're connecting other people that should meet. The super connector sees networking as an opportunity for them to give the ultimate gift to the world. That the super connector takes pleasure out of introducing two people that should meet, getting them fused in a connected conversation, and dropping out, expecting nothing in return, having an absolute sense of humility that even though you made a connection, it didn't create anything. The people had to act on that for that to become something. So you're not a prospector and you're also not a broker. You're a connector. Mm. I believe that we should connect three people every week. That should be a goal. Friday by three. So today, I have already met my goal. I'm glad to say I did it yesterday mm. afternoon. I literally chronicle this every week. And, you know, sometimes you might do it face-to-face um, -face if possible. It's getting harder and harder these days. Um, sometimes I've been able to do it over video, which I love. It's my favorite new platform to communicate, sometimes through a call. But I've really been working a lot, Leo, on the three-way email technique. I'm sure people have tried to introduce you to somebody else over email, but I got to say, throwing it over the wall is wasting a good opportunity. So if I'm going to be like, hey, Randy, I want you to meet Leo. You guys go off and be rock stars. That is the worst super connector introduction. <laughs> Not to get wonky again, but the technique here goes as follows. In every networking introduction, there's the benefactor and the beneficiary. Okay? The benefactor usually has the resource. The beneficiary is the person you met somewhere and you found out the beneficiary needs to meet the benefactor, okay? So just to understand that. So when you write the email, the first thing you do is you introduce the benefactor to the beneficiary. Hi, I want you to meet my good buddy, Leo, and your name is underlined and linked to your LinkedIn profile or your website, but usually I like LinkedIn profile because it focuses really more on your resume to generate credibility. And I say, uh, I give him the context. I met Leo recently doing a broadcast, and he's working on X. If there's a link, I point to it. I thought he would be a good person for you to meet because of why. And then I usually add a little bit of credibility saying, and I believe that Leo is a good person. I believe that Leo is changing the world with what he's doing. I believe that this would be a win for you and your business as well. And that's the little opening paragraph. And then the next paragraph is to the beneficiary. So now I say, hey, Leo, as I was telling you about, I want you to meet Randy, underline straight to his LinkedIn profile. Um, he has this resource, this company, this set of contacts that I think will be very beneficial to the project you're working on. And by the way, I've known him for a long time and I think he'd be a good node in your network, Tim. And that's the email I send. But before I send that email, I'm going to call or text the benefactor, right? So I'm going to call or text Randy and be like, dude, you're getting ready to get an email and you know I don't send these every day to you. Please take a minute to read it. I think this is a good introduction. Mm. Then I send the email, and if I don't see the beneficiary responding quickly, I'm going to call that person the next day and go, dude, what are you doing? I told you, Randy's a guy you need to meet. So once I know they're talking and they're trying to find a time to get on the phone or whatever, it's off my list and out of my, my, out of my mind forever. And that, my friends, is my networking connecting technique. Well, it's great. It, uh, and what's nice about it is you're not – First of all, you're being much more specific up front, and you're not stepping out too early. Um, so yeah, you got to get you got to get them connected. That's the whole point of it. That's what makes yeah. you a super connector instead of a well wisher. Exactly. So talk a little bit about compassion. Compassion so is your cool. your desire that other people in your life do not suffer unnecessarily. Compassion is your attachment to their day to day happiness, whether they're going to achieve their hopes and dreams. Compassion is a human connectedness that nothing will ever replace. No machine, no software, no technology. You have that compassion for your family. You have that compassion for people that you went to high school with that you're still chatting up on Facebook. But I wondered when I wrote the book, and I wonder still to this day, why do we leave compassion in our car when we go to work? I think sometimes we think it makes us look weak. I think sometimes it makes us vulnerable. It sets us up to have our feelings hurt, and we just reserve that for in-laws, right? So in work situations, I have encouraged people, listen, be human. 
care about that person today because I guarantee you when I see you 45 years from now, I used to say this a long time ago, in Boca Raton and we're shuffling around, <laughs> we're not going to talk about what we accumulated or titles on business cards. We're going to talk about those wonderful people that we did time with at IBM. And we're not going to think back on them dispassionately. We may have in the moment to protect ourselves. So I say, much like Stephen Covey, senior wrote, it changed my life. Start with the end in mind because that's what compassion is. It is recognizing that the only thing you love to do is be alive with other humans. So do it at work. And how I apply this is I let compassion become the center of how I design solutions and how I react to other people. Because everything we do at work is either a design issue or a reaction issue. So in conversations, we react to each other. Do we do it with compassion in mind? Am I thinking about that as I react to you? Meaning, is empathy part of my toolkit? Because I'm telling you, Leo, empathy is a superpower for leaders and few possess it. When I'm trying to solve a problem, whether I'm thinking about the structure of my company or a new product or a new marketing plan or a new compensation scheme, have I put compassion at the center of the table? And you say, well, you can't run a business putting solve unnecessary suffering at the center of the table. I'm like, what about design oriented companies like you know Tesla or Apple or other organizations where customer experience design is about compassion, right? I mean, the whole secret to customer experience design is to eliminate unnecessary suffering and whenever possible, produce memorable moments of happiness. So why don't we lead like that? That's what I mean by leading with compassion. I think it also inspires us to get to know one another in the workplace, not for our job title and not for mm -hmm. what we do, but for who we are as people. And the mm -hmm. more we can understand each other on that level and see each other's strengths or see each other's maybe differences in the way they work as, uh, as gifts and as real opportunities and as strengths yeah. as opposed to things that are uh, inconvenient or difficult for us to understand sometimes is uh, really essential. But, you know, as you talk about these concepts and, and, love and culture and um i'd love to get a sense because you know here you were as a uh, chief solutions officer at yahoo i assume that uh coming up with solutions wasn't yours charge alone that you had to lead a team of people in order to help right. uh, do that so i'd love to get a sense of here you've got this team that's charged with really coming up um with great ideas working together being together and being about the work um, so I'd love to get a sense of how you were able to accomplish um, just a really powerful work environment there. Okay, so let me set the stage for you. So this is late 2000, it's after the dot-com crash. We've lost a lot of our old client base of dot-com companies like eToys and other folks that went kaput. We had a very short period of time to develop advertising programs that really worked. Enterprise services that really mattered to Fortune 5000 companies, and we had to go rebuild our business with old school companies that didn't think we delivered any value. Okay, so it was a really trying time. And if we pivot a little bit, I wrote a book just last year about this called Deal Storming. I talk a lot about this. What I learned, Leo, is that genius is a team sport. I really applied some things that one of my managers taught me when I was working at cubansbroadcast.com. He taught me when you get stuck, don't go down alone. Make collaboration your first response and not the last resort. And, and don't confuse line work with teamwork. And this is a thing that leaders really get wrong. They stay inside whatever their departmental silo is, and they hand work off to one another based on roles and job descriptions. And they say, we're working together as a team. I'm like, no, you're working together like an efficient Denny's, okay? The, the host seats you, the server takes the order, the cook makes the order, the server serves it to you, the host settles your check, the busboy clears the table, the janitor cleans the restaurant. Folks, that's not the team. That is a factory line of human beings. Teamwork occurs when the busboy notices that your pancakes have been sitting under the light too long and has the initiative to deliver those pancakes to a now satisfied customer. That that is teamwork. And I learned that what we had to do at Yahoo was create teamwork by starting with information collaboration. Because when you can pull everybody who has a stake in the outcome into a room, have them lay down their department agenda shields and reveal what they know and share what they think, and you can lead constructive debate around the next play, you 
forge connections to between people across the company. Although the Yahoo case study has not turned out well, many of them don't, by the way. Think of companies like Atari, for example. Um, there was a diaspora out of that company um, today of vibrant leaders, the CEO of LinkedIn, Jeff Weiner, for example, who I believe will run Microsoft someday. Um, the presidents of uh, really interesting new companies like GoFundMe, um, the presidents of uh, Indiegogo, you know, the great fundraising platform. Um, I know so many people that came out of that culture and they took that simple idea with them that you find the stakeholders, you put them in a room, you champion the concept that ideas can come from anywhere and you recognize when people have made a contribution, especially those outside of your department, and you create that culture. Because here's the thing, solving problems is about speed and agility, where every meeting and every conference call must produce the next play. And what we've learned at my company, Deeper Media, is that when you increase the number of perspectives in a room, you dramatically increase the likelihood that you will notice what everybody's been missing, connect the dots, and walk out of the room with the next play that moves the needle. You know, part of what has come up time and time again, I think, when we think about the challenges we face in this world, um, in terms of people talking with one another, listening to one another, uh, not responding. If someone doesn't agree with you, to shut them off and shut them down. Mm -hmm. And it does appear, however, that the more leaders we have encouraging dialogue, encourage people, encouraging people to listen to one another and work together, um, the better off we are. And I would love, love it if you had any advice for leaders today who in this, during these difficult times, it's a politically charged uh, world we live in right now. Uh, it's, uh, you know, with a lot of change. And uh, yeah. so what would be your be advice? Uh, what would your advice be for leaders as we start meeting the challenges of the next several years? Um, he'd, the belief of the late Sam Walton when he said, curiosity doesn't kill the cat, it kills the competition, okay? As a leader, be more curious and less reactive. When someone has an opinion that's different than yours, look at it as a learning opportunity. Seek to understand what's behind it. The most important command a leader can give these days is the following three words, tell me more. If you really want to learn what's coming next, you have to grasp the things that bug you most. And I'll give you a starting point for those of you that are my age. Um, I want you to think differently about millennials. Millennials are something that we can tend to always kind of talk about like it was a bad word. No, they're different. They're as different as the boomers were to the greatest generation that did not understand them either for a bunch of different reasons. But somehow the greatest generation understood that the boomers had a skill set and a value set that was the future and it's time for us to make that same decision. I think what we have to do is we as leaders need to embrace why they are different, understanding that generational cohorts aren't about values. It's about context. As Maslow would say, where were you when you were 11? That determines your generational attitude. The millennials were raised online. They were raised in a world of school shootings, 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, where they understand to their bones that they don't have much time. That's why they're impatient. They can't really depend on anything from an organizational standpoint. That's why they move around a lot in their employment life. But most importantly, they can't succeed without the kindness of strangers. And this is why they're so good at building teams and working as tribes and communities. And if we as leaders would try to learn from them and let them mentor us, I think not only would we create a better environment for them to be successful, we would learn so much to maintain our relevance well into our 70s and 80s. Well, I could not agree more with that sentiment. You know, I uh, have been serving as an adjunct professor, both for at the graduate and undergraduate level for a number of years now, uh, worked with so many millennials, and I've never been more impressed uh, with a group of people or saw, mm -hmm. or saw more opportunities to learn for mm -hmm. how they see the world, how they think about things, all the influences they have had that are quite different from the world that we grew up in, uh, obviously. And I think it's a remarkable generation in many respects. And I think that the more that we are, are open to their ideas and, and the way they work, and I think we're going to see some extraordinary um, you know, things from this generation. And by the way, the generations to follow. You, you know, you talked earlier about um, 
you know, the Greeks, I often read, who knows if it was apocryphal or not, but this idea that even Plato complained that, ah, this next generation, boy, we're, the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket, right? Well, somehow. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. You know, somehow. We judge we, what we don't understand, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the issue. And, and even like, you know, you mentioned politics. You know, politics is crazy now, Leo. I don't talk about politics online or at my speeches or inside right. my company because it divides people. But therein lies an opportunity, okay? So on the one hand, we could learn a lot about people who feel underserved and underrepresented. On the other hand, we could learn a lot about people's desire for more transparency in government, um, less power concentrated to single individuals. Um, those are two sides that are fighting right now. But we as business designers and leaders, we need to step back and ask ourselves, okay, how does that make a difference in our market? Because I've been studying this. It makes a profound difference in so many markets from consumer to B2B. We can engineer how we think about our business by looking at that express negativity from a, like a not attached point of view. Again, getting more curious than judgmental. Um, and I think that we need to seize that opportunity because times are divisive because desires are now very lucid in people's minds and they're talking about them in a way they haven't talked about them in decades. My hope too is that this people will see that the fact that the divisiveness is not getting us anywhere. You know, it's so interesting, uh, you know, Harry Truman, um, when he was uh, running for president, ran against this, the Do Nothing Congress at the time. Mm -hmm. And the Do Nothing Congress back then um, labeled that actually still produced more public legislation than the 112th, 113th, and 114th Congresses combined. So you've got to really <laughs> step back and say, it shouldn't be acceptable to go back to your congressional district or wherever, or your constituents at any level and mm -hmm. say, hey, I fought the good fight. We didn't make anything happen. You know, I mean, I don't think uh, you or I would survive in our jobs if we constantly went back to the people that we were working for and say, right. hey, um, sorry, no, no results today. Yeah, um, and that's the way I feel about it. It's like, it's like when we have a meeting. If you have a meeting at work and the result of the meeting is this is great, but we're going to have another meeting in a month, I just want to pull my hair out and somebody's <laughs> hair next to me, okay? The purpose of a meeting is to find the next play. The purpose of congressional gatherings is to find the next play that moves the needle. That's right. why we come back to this idea of is collaboration a first response or a last resort? Well, we can't change Congress, but we can change the way we lead we can hire different people that are more supple when it comes to working outside the lines. We can change how we onboard people so this is a crystal clear value from day one. And we can make, do they work together with others as a team? The number one question we ask before we make somebody a manager or a leader at our company. So I think we uniquely as business people can learn from this dysfunction and make sure it doesn't happen to us as well. Well, I think this notion of uh, first response versus, um, you know, last resort and the, and the fact that genius is a team sport is something that I hope uh, us as, as business leaders, political leaders, uh, people in the media, people working for NGOs, uh, that they can all embrace this sentiment because I think what we can do Me too. is really, really powerful. So, Tim, I want to thank, thank you. you so much for being on the program. I mean, you gave our listeners and me certainly, uh, you know, so many great uh, nuggets of uh, information and wisdom that I'm sure we'll be able to take with us, uh, you know, for many years to come. So thanks so much. Absolutely. And by the way, um, I created a page on my website where I parked an excerpt of Love is the Killer app, the one that ran in Fast Company, like 5,000 words, plus an excerpt from Deal Storming called Sales Genius is a Team Sport. They're there on the page. It's timsanders.com front slash peer. Timsanders.com front slash peer. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. To learn more about Peer Advantage, to submit questions to Leo and our guest, and to subscribe to the Year of the Peer podcast, please visit us at leobatari.com. It's L-E-O-B-O-T-T-A-R-Y dot com. This podcast is produced by me, Randy Cantrell. Hosted, of course, by Leo Batari. Music provided by Kevin McLeod, Vibe Ace. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License.